Um, my name is Tim Stevenson, I'm from the University of Leeds uh, in the UK, uh, and we are a, uh, a partner in the Euromet project, uh, METCO, uh, with the role of developing uh, high temperature piezoelectric materials for the metrology techniques that are being developed by the NMI partners. Um, so I'm going to quickly, as a training event I guess, quickly go through um, some of the fundamentals of piezoelectricity, although not dwell too much because I guess uh, most people here have a fairly good idea. Um, and then just sort of go through the high, temp high temperature applications that we're trying to address, uh, some of the figures of merit that we need to, to look at in a material to, to using these techniques. Uh, and then just sort of go through some of these materials and have a look at what we've selected and how we've made them. <coughs> so the piezoelectric effect, as we all know, uh, is the interconversion between the mechanical and electrical energy, uh, and there's two effects, the direct and converse, uh, and it's probably useful to mention that all the measurement techniques that we've developed uh, as the project are all in the converse mode, uh, and that's a feature of some of the figures of merit that we'll be looking at later. And the other thing is we've been looking exclusively at uh, ferroelectric piezoelectrics, and um, particular perovskites, uh, and there's several reasons for that, which I'll go through later. Um, but to define that, I guess, the ferroelectric um, materials uh, in perovskite form in the ABO3 structure uh, must possess a spontaneous polarisation below the Curie point, uh, and the example here being lead titanate um, uh, characterised by a polarisation uh, loop. Uh, and as we drive around the with the electric field, we can see that it changes the crystal structure. And that's the fundamental basis uh, of developing the piezoelectric strain. Um, so all materials undergo electrostriction, but um, specifically the piezoelectric strain uh, is characterized by its linear deformation uh, with applied field and the negative strain when that's reversed. Uh, and just a sort of definition of the sort of three types of strain I'll be talking about today, just so that we're, they're clear. The, we'll talk about crystal crystallographic strain, as a C over A, a ratio into trigonal unit cells, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, and just a bit more about the sort of going from the atomistic view into uh, the kind of physical things we hold, uh, the structure hierarchy. So we start with the unit cell, uh, these then form domains, um, and then we can get grains. Again, you see the domains in this image. Uh, and when the grains are agglomerated, we get our physical ceramic. And a lot of the ceramics, or all the ceramics I'll be talking about, will be polycrystalline. Uh, but the, in the project, we've been looking at single crystals as well. Uh, and then just to sort of define the applications again, so Paul's already mentioned them, but we can use them in three different modes. Uh, in the direct mode, converting the stress into electric signal. The converse, which is what we're using mostly through the project. Uh, converting an electric field into a displacement, uh, and then things like transducers, which use a combination of these effects um, to well, do lots of things, uh, but ultrasound is a, is a key component of that. Uh, and the majority of all these applications, I guess, are based uh, on PZT. If you look at the, um, the market for piezoelectric uh, devices, something that Tim will talk about later, um, it's a $15 billion um, market. And um, that is governed, I think about 95% is uh, based on PZT. And if you break that down as well into why we're looking particularly at the converse effect, is that the uh, transducers and actuators make up 80% of that market um, compared to sensors and other devices. Uh, and PZT is a fascinating material. Um, its properties come from this uh, mixing of phases, so if crystallographic, crystallographically based, so mixing the rhombohedral into trigonal phase to develop um, these <coughs> coefficients um, which we use day in and day out. Uh, but it comes with limitations, and I guess in the scope of the METCO project that is uh, temperature. Um, so the piezoelectric Curie point is about 320 degrees on this MPB. Uh, but the realistic long-term usage is only up to about 200 uh, and as the temperature increases a lot of the losses increase with that uh, and we can become problematic specifically for actuators. Um, so we are looking at 
high temperature materials, and I guess why would we spend all the time and money doing that? Um, demanding environments are becoming increasingly uh, larger concern, uh, especially for industry. Uh, and in the UK, the Technology Strategy Board, Innovate UK, so is the industrial arm of government funding. Uh, they have defined uh, these as the top demanding environments that they want to tackle for the next five years, uh, with high temperature and ultra high temperature at the top of that list. And these are split across a whole range of different industrial sectors, including aerospace, uh, exploration, energy, and defence. Uh, and I take some of the examples typical environments uh, require repeated thermal cycles of 150. Um, but now we're moving into the, the realm where there's increasing need for 500, and in aerospace is even more extreme. They can go up to uh, 1,000 degrees centigrade uh, in some parts and need 100,000 hours um, of usage. And that is captured in this slide, I guess. So uh, Airbus claim that fuel saving of 1 to 2% um, through more precise control and, uh, and sensing. Um, can save one to two percent in fuel, and if you consider that the UK alone burns nearly three million, three billion pounds of kerosene a year, that has considerable uh, millions uh, of pounds worth of saving. Um, so, as Paul explained, this is the aim of the Metco project is to therefore characterise these materials um, for these different applications. So, some of the figures of merit we've been looking at. Um, we we'll start off with the I guess the key ones are things like Curie temperature, Curie point, and what we've sort of termed the depolling temperature. So the Curie uh, point is a uh, temperature at which the material undergoes a fundamental phase transition from uh, ferroelectric to non-ferroelectric or paraelectric, uh, and ceases to become piezoelectric at that point. And the depolling temperature is what, what we're using is to define the operational temperature of the material and whether that temperature occurs due to accelerated aging, uh, conductivity or whatever, that is the point at which we cease to see the properties that you could use uh, as a device. Uh, and this is captured quite well in a paper by uh, Jim Bennett who's in the audience uh, and that sort of defines that quite nicely. So we're also looking at uh, dielectric permittivity uh, and Measuring that as a function of temperature to determine our Curie temperature. I thought it was interesting to note we're determining these using different methods. So we've determined depolling temperature from resonance uh, or uh, strain field type measurements uh, and the Curie point from X ray diffraction or permittivity temperature plots. Uh, it's also important to consider dielectric loss because um, these materials, uh, the loss becomes an important component as we start to heat them up. Um, most importantly, I guess, for our measurements is going to be the charge strain coefficients. So we want to be able to plug an electric field and measure a physical strain. Uh, and this, I guess you can see everywhere, so it's going to it. And we're particularly looking at D33 for our measurements. Um, just, that's just what we chose to make it uh, uniform across all the different techniques. Uh, and we're, not, we're sort of less concerned with the voltage coefficient as it's fairly temperature insensitive. Um, K, electromechan electromechanical coupling factor is important. It's the ratio of converted energy with respect to the input energy. Um, but this also acts to limit our charge coefficient. If K has to be less than one, then certainly uh, these are limiting factors. And it's not just D, uh, but also the compliance and permittivity uh, is then a factor of that. And so it's finding materials that, that match these to get up, up the, big, the largest D that we can achieve uh, and the largest K. Uh, and typical values can range from the whole, well, the whole breadth of 0 to 1, uh, looking at different things, single crystals of uh, PMNT to PZT polycrystalline, the lead-free materials tend to be a little less, and then uh, things like quartz. Uh, but again, this seems to be temperature insensitive due to the relationship between uh, D and permittivity. Uh, interesting, this is a nice plot where you can see that there's 120 commercial materials taken from the data sheets plotted out. Uh, K is a function of D33. Uh, the quality factor is something that we haven't uh, necessarily measured, but it's something we've 
taking into account, but particularly for our measurements, uh, the electrical uh, quality factor. Uh, is a lot of what we're going to be looking at is the off-resonance devices uh, and looking at heat generation, apart from the actual resonance measurement that has been taken by MPL. Uh, so that's something we've been looked at. And resistivity has been the, I guess, the ultimate killer so far. Uh, we require higher, high resistance to uh, be able to apply these large electric fields that we want to do for measurement uh, and in any device, I guess, that, that is also important. Uh, and we need to, to, to watch this charge uh, or RC time constant to be able to have a, a, a charge time um, so that we can apply the electric field and actually have it there long enough that we can take the measurement um, or the opposite way in it as a sensor. Uh, some of the things that I guess have, are typically overlooked uh, in the literature uh, when we consider high temperature materials, things like thermal expansion coefficient, which are extremely important when you want to take these materials and then put them into a device, uh, and resonant frequency, um, again, is related to the geometry density and elastic properties, so we need to understand them to be able to do some of the techniques that will be described later. Uh, and I guess this is just a quick overview of some of the important figures of merit that we've established for the three types. And I'll, so we're going to focus mainly on, on these, these set here. So for the MECO project, we had to uh, put out some material requirements. So what is it that we actually wanted to measure? What was our top three things that we wanted? Uh, and obviously, high temperature operation was number one. It had to be able to survive, uh, or BP's electric at those temperatures. Uh, and we wanted it to sort of start from around 200, so we weren't measuring um, uh, uh, other things. Uh, PZT is very good, that's why we want to measure anything uh, against it. So we were really looking at the 200 to 1000 range. 1000 is the top uh, temperature of which we can measure at MPL. Uh, and they need to have fairly thermally stable coefficients. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't um, you know, be on a straight line with a a huge gradient, but they needed to kind of be well mapped and well characterised, uh, and not, I don't know, not not be waves of of data that we couldn't really correlate. Uh, we really wanted to have some good charge coefficients, uh, and this is especially important because if you remember, we're doing a metrology exercise, and so we're trying to reduce the error in our measurements. So we wanted to have charge coefficients that were sort of above 100 so we could use, uh, use these techniques to measure the strain and get some uh, small uncertainty budgets and all the new words of uh, metrology. Um, so if you consider measuring something like quartz at 3 picocoulombs per newton, you need picometer resolution to be able to measure that at uh, 2,000 volts. Uh, and then kind of the things that we had uh, later were mechanically, chemically and thermally robust um, materials because these will be seeing a range of environments from a vacuum, uh, air, different temperatures. Um, they could be sat in different chemicals or gas. Um, we want to have reasonable permittivity uh, and particularly a high resistivity. But as we'll see later, it's not, well, we can't have everything. <laughs> uh, so we looked initially at the single crystal uh, family uh, and these materials, and you can get some incredible single crystal materials. Um, and one of the really nice things is some of these can relinquish the effects of pyroelectricity um, as with the non-polar piezoelectrics. Uh, so the pyroelectric polarization direction is different to the, the piezoelectric one, and you can separate them, and that would be a really nice measurement for metrology, because you can measure one exclusively. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of these materials have DP3s or D11s that are just too low for the techniques that we wanted to pursue. Um, although I think we have done some measurements on quartz, um, just to sort of show the difference. Uh, but the temperature profile of the perovskite single crystals here is not stable. If you consider uh, things like the PYNT and BSPT family, um, particularly these go through uh, polymorphic phase transitions about 160 degrees, and it changes all the properties, and it became, becomes very difficult to map them as a metrology exercise. Uh, so we looked at the polycrystalline piezo ceramics, uh, sort of single materials. These are much easier to synthesize, uh, much quicker, so we could make hundreds of pellets to measure uh, and, and get repeatable measurements. Uh, but again, we have a range of uh, sensitivities, uh, and they're proportional with conductivity, uh, and they have usually a, a lower K 
than we were looking for. So we haven't discounted them, but they, they weren't on top of our list to start with. Uh, and we moved into the mixed phase polycrystalline materials to mimic, I guess, PZT. And PZT is extremely good, so why do anything different? Again, these are easy to synthesize, uh, and they have much larger charge coefficients, and we're kind of in the, the range now of the charge coefficients that we wanted to be able to get accurate measurements. Uh, and all of these materials are based on phase mixing, um, being the key to improving their properties, and then using doping to reduce conductivity. And that's kind of the, the route we took in developing the material leaves, which is the BFKBT PT system. Um, so if we put them in a table, sort of a combination of all those materials, this is the kind of region we were looking at to achieve with our materials. So uh, DT degrees of above 100, and with period points about 500 degrees. So, you know, reasonable temperature and charge coefficient area, and that was our sort of start. Um, we're going to focus mainly on this material, KBT, BFBT, because it's a Leeds uh, material, uh, and it was uh, a project of one of our PhD students, Jim, who's in the audience, uh, that he spent time developing, uh, and it's a Leeds uh, proprietary material, which has got, gone forward, which Tim will talk about later. So just to plot these are on a, on a chart, I guess, um, piezoelectric DP3 versus Q temperature, this is the, the region we wanted to look at for activity, the region we wanted to look at in temperature, this is kind of how we got to where we were. And how we make these things. So I guess these materials can come in a whole range of sizes and shapes, from polycrystalline materials, thin films, composites, we've got uh, stacks and single crystals, and we can make all of these uh, at Leeds, but I think um, Taj is going to talk about this later, processing of bismuth ferrite more, uh, more so. So I'm going to focus predominantly on the bulk polycrystalline materials which we use in this project. Uh, so from taking them from raw materials, the preparation of the powder, calcination, shape forming, sintering, and then uh, finishing. So we've taken the raw materials, um, range of sizes as you can see, and these are then milled. And we have a range of milling techniques that leads uh, these ball milling, planetary mills, uh, or attrition milling, uh, and this is a nice slide, um, although you can't quite see it on this television. So the attrition milling gives us a nice uh, small distribution of particle size, uh, which we can take forward, uh, and we get a nice uniform size powder at the end of it. We can take that powder uh, and put it through calcination, and this causes the interaction and interdiffusion of ions. So we're partially reacting the material, uh, gives us a good homogeneity uh, and reduces the shrinkage and other things that we're going to see later to, to give us a, quite a, a reproducible material, because that's going to be quite important in doing metrology. Uh, we can see we can take our material here and then re, uh, sorry, calcine it and we get this very uniform um, powder at the end. And then shape form these, and so these we just use a uniaxial press. These are poured into uh, the press, into a die, sorry, press, and we get a pellet out at the end. Uh, we use binders and plasticizers to achieve a good density, and we can also isopress them uh, to get a green density of about 50% before we put them in to sinter. Uh, and the sintering temperature, uh, typically between 0.8 and 0.9 at the melting temperature, and it acts to bind our, brine, uh, bind our brains into a solid uh, ceramic lump. Um, and what we do is play around, particularly once we've got our sort of base materials, is with the heating and cooling rates uh, to achieve different material uh, properties. We can control microstructure uh, and uh, crystallography with that. Uh, and you can see as an example, if we slow cool these materials, we get nice polycrystalline lumps of ceramic, which we can hold and use, and they're highly dense, whereas if we cool it, if we take this out of the oven, for example, and put it on a plate, the material instantly disintegrates. And this is an effect of the crystallographic strain being generated. Um, it's just the tetragonal form is much higher in volume, and it's forming very quickly. Um, not quite Spielberg, but you can sort of see that happening. So the grains are actually popping out the material, and they're quite energetic. Um, so they're actually being forced out as they convert from rhombohedra to tetragonal. So the processing is really, really important uh, to be able to really hone in on the properties that we want for our high temperature materials. 
I think this goes from solid to a complete powder in something like two minutes. Um, so it's quite fascinating. But I won't bore you with the whole the whole video. <laughs> Uh, and this is demonstrated quite nicely when you look at X-ray diffraction plots, just by changing, this is changing composition, but then changing just the cooling rate, for example, we can see that we can make fully dense ceramics with a range of crystallographic phases by changing composition. Uh, and by changing the cooling rate, we can actually do the same, but it's much more abrupt. So we can really induce uh, strain-driven transformations in these materials quite readily, and that really affects our high temperature properties. Seems to have frozen. Oh, that's a picture, that's why. Uh, so this is a, a plot, basically, simplifying these on really easy to see. So this is the phase fraction versus composition for the materials, depending on uh, composition uh, at slow cooling rates. Uh, to finish these, uh, we take them through grinding and polishing. Um, so initial grinding is done with silicon carbide, uh, and then we polish using diamond and colloidal silica. Uh, for this project, we've had to go uh, additionally further, uh, and we're trying to achieve really high parallelism, parallelisms here, so less than four up seconds, and that is actually quite uh, challenging to have used a specialist company to do that, but the reason we need to do that is they need to, some of the techniques we're using involve uh, reflecting laser off the surface, and that needs to really be reflected back up the same way it came. So if you look at this as a phase interferogram, yeah. Uh, so these are three pellets, and these have been run onto a silica block, which is this part here, and you can see that they, the, the, the phase lines are not disturbed, which means that they are as parallel as the block that they're sat on. Um, and we've, to get that, we also need a, a flatness of less than two nanometers from peak to drop, <coughs> or roughness, I guess. Um, and then at the end, we can do composition analysis to make sure that what we've got um, is actually a homogeneous material, and that the effects of what we see are actually due to uh, you know, the, crystal, the crystallography, the p-vectric effect, and not uh, compositional variances. Uh, so we've used EPMA, wavelength dispersive X-ray um, data, to look at that. And what's nice about um, these look, each one of these is a different uh, bar, so believe me when I say these are <laughs> compositionally homogeneous. But what's nice about this technique is you get part per million uh, resolution per pixel, rather than, uh, so BDX uses a true or false value for whether the element exists. So we can really get into the, the composition of these things and, and have a look around and confirm that they are what they are. And from this we can see there's no compositional inhomogeneity. Um, I guess the final part is the electroding and polling. Uh, and this has been quite a challenge for the project, is we needed to find an electrode that would stick on to the ceramics and survive, uh, potentially up to a thousand, although for these materials, we only want to go to about 500. And uh, we've been through a range of metals, and it's quite interesting. The platinum uh, is typically used for high temperature materials, and it's a good option. It doesn't oxidize, but it does react with bismuth, which is one of the key components of our ceramic. Uh, and it also acts as a catalyst, um, and so it kind of just falls off instantly as soon as it's uh, heated up. Uh, so we've sort of had to mark that one off. Silver, we've used silver, we've also used silver pastes. Uh, they're fine, but when we're heating up to above 500 degrees to look for the curie point of these materials, it oxidizes again, turns yellow, becomes non-conductive, um, so it hasn't been ideal. Uh, we use straight gold, <coughs> though we applied these in different forms, the thermo evaporation or magnetron sputtering. Uh, thermo evaporation technique um, forms agglomerates and islands and um, becomes non-conductive across the surface. Uh, magnetron sputtering is quite good, it gives a good, good even a uniform uh, coating. Uh, it has to be thicker than 100 nanometers to be conductive. But when it's gold just straight onto the, the bismuth-based ceramic, that again uh, peels off um, some of the work function of the material. But it just doesn't bond, basically. And there's a huge discrepancy between the thermal expansion of the gold then and the, and the ceramic. So when you heat it up, it literally comes off like a film. Uh, and you can, like a coin. Uh, so we use uh, chrome gold, which you see typically um, a lot of pieces of teaser done with chrome silver, chrome gold. 
put that on. Again, the thermal mismatch didn't work. We eventually came to titanium gold. Um, the titanium acts as a nice barrier layer. So it does two things. One, it, uh, it's what's the same material as that there's titanium in the ceramic, so it, you get a nice bond, so it affixes very well to the surface. Um, it has better thermal properties, so it doesn't peel off, and it also means that golds can sit on it uh, quite happily, and we get good adhesion with that, but again, about 500 degrees, the gold becomes slightly matte, but it's still conductive, but it's, but it's still not perfect. I think this has been one of the biggest challenges <laughs> that we've had during the project. Uh, the samples then been polled in heated silicone oil uh, above the coercive field to align the domains uh, and then left for 24 hours before any measurements uh, are undertaken. Uh, what's the thickness of the titanium? The titanium, uh, we tried a range, it doesn't seem to be have that much effect as long as it's over about 50 nanometers. So you can put 50, 100, 200, it doesn't make that much difference. And the gold just needs to be over 100 uh, to be conducted. Yeah. And the method of the deposition? Uh, Magnetron sputtering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you do, we have a dual head sputterer, so it will sputter one, closes the gate, turns it around, does the next one, yeah. the second target. Yeah. You find it to be better than chrome? Than chrome, yeah. yeah um, only because it bonds better. I don't know whether it necessarily is electrically better or anything else, but it, the chrome ones just, again, they peel off. And you can't. You, we had a sticky tape test. Mm -hmm. You put a tape on and rip it off. Does it come off? And almost always yes. And that was the only one that didn't. But you could still. You can rub it with your thumb, uh, and you know some of the, the pure gold just comes straight off like uh, powder. Uh, so to summarise, the materials the guess that we we chose was from this uh, BFKBT PT system. Um, what it gave us is we can modify the lead titanate content. Uh, and play around with some of the different properties. We could change the, the uh, charge coefficient, the Curie temperature to, to really, I don't know, make a range of materials that we can test uh, and test the sensitivity of measurement techniques. And rather oddly, they've been assigned these numbers, but you'll see these throughout the talks today. Uh, and it's just important the higher the number, I guess the less lead as we go. Um, and then here is, so this is an example of some of the materials. So then, this is, I guess, just to show, although the measurement techniques are going to be built to be really accurate, actually making these things, we still get some variance in, in manufacturing them. And we're by, by no means making them like uh, you know, uh, Morgan or Megit would make ceramics. We're not a manufacturing facility, we are a university, so we're really making these handmade materials. But even given that, the invariance is quite low, so uh, it's a Good, good set of data really, and the, the highlighted, so the solid ones are, and they've been before they've been polished, and the uh, the open ones after they've been polished, and you can see that they're, they're a lot, the invariance becomes smaller after being polished, just because we've removed some of the crystallographic uh, impurities on the surface. I think, uh, and then this is just a, these are some of the typical plots that we would measure at Leeds. Um, and I guess the whole point of the METCO project was to take these kind of measurements and actually make them uh, into a standard. Uh, and so I'll hand over to whoever's next to start talking to us about these measurement techniques. The surface and basically that needs to be reflected back up to measure. Okay.